to produce this, so we developed a tool to study the receptor. Uh, we looked at these uh, compounds where you have flexible methoxy groups. So here's DOB, it's got these two methoxy groups. And we locked those around so we could define how they bound to the receptor. And there are two compounds now called dragonfly and bromo dragonfly, which I've gotten requests from forensic labs for samples because they're appearing on the drug market now. Um, this one may work, I'm not sure. Can you read that? The woman on the left, the top one says, life is beautiful, the world is beautiful, I am beautiful. The woman on the right says, have you been taking Prozac? And the woman says, heck no, it's ecstasy for me. And by the way, you're beautiful too. <laughs> and this is, me in, this is me in 1986, this is one of, the four, one of the four flasks full of ecstasy that ended up being used for clinical studies. I looked a little younger then, 22 years ago. Uh, these were papers where we established that MDMA was not a classical hallucinogenic amphetamine and uh, named it uh, intactogen. You know, there was a great intactogen and pathogen debate between Ralph Metzger and myself. Um, in Europe, they're called intactogens. Over here, I'm not, they're called empathogens or whatever you want to call them. We did a lot of work on tryptamines. What is the alternate reality salad? It's made with mushrooms from the chef's own garden and some species of psilocybe. We worked on tryptamines. You may know that psilocybin is orally active. If you eat mushrooms, they work. But if you take something with DMT, it doesn't work. You have to smoke it. We did a study where we showed the reason for that. Complicated study using high field nuclear magnetic resonance. And then this bottom paper is just the paper we published showing improvements to the synthesis of psilocybin so you can now make it without the possibility of blowing your lab up. LSD. I did get involved in some LSD research, and this is LSD in the bottom. It says, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And there's a little caricature of me, which you can't see. Um, proposed in 1976 that LSD had a... You want me to stop now? Okay. Showed that LSD had effects not only at serotonin receptors, but also at dopamine receptors. And that's an area we're pursuing now that looks really interesting. Made analogs of LSD that are even more potent than LSD. This one on the part left called ethylad. has an ethyl rather than a methyl. It's uh, somewhat more potent than LSD on a potency basis, on a milligram, microgram basis. But psychologically, is much more powerful than LSD. No study has really been done on that since its discovery. The other two compounds on a weight basis, microgram basis, are equal potent to LSD, but they're more benign, more like psilocybin or THC. Um, one study, which I don't think you probably can see, but I'll tell you what this is. LSD has its, LSD stands for lysergic acid diethyl amide, basically. Diethyl amide means there are these two ethyl groups out on the end of the molecule that can swing around. And if you change those to anything else, the potency of the compound is about one-tenth LSD. So you go from diethyl to dimethyl, or ethyl methyl, or dimethyl, anything else, you knock the activity of the compound down. We wondered why. So what we did is took the two ethyl groups and we hooked them into a ring where the ethyls could point either on the same side of the ring or on opposite sides of the ring this way or on opposite sides of the ring this way. We tested those three. Turns out only one of them was active. So the one on the bottom left. And so we established that LSD binds to the receptor with those ethyls in a very specific orientation. What we're doing now is mutating the actual receptor and doing computer-based computational models to determine why that diethyl is so unique. And it probably involves a constellation of three adjacent amino acids that lock it in. So there's a very specific place in the serotonin 2A receptor that exactly fits LSD diethyl amide, which is a kind of interesting observation. Why is it there? And then in 1993, we did, uh, I was the founding president of the Hefter Research Institute. Uh, we haven't funded a lot of research to date, about 1.8 million, uh, but basically we've encouraged a lot of people, we've given a lot of people seed money, pilot money, uh, and really said, you know, you can do this, what do you need? We've helped them work on their protocols, we've shared our uh, collective wisdom with them. So that's been a good thing. So my postdoctoral mentor, when I got at Purdue, I'd been there a couple years and I saw him, he said, Dave, I never thought you'd get funded to do work on psychedelics. Um, I was funded for 27 years. I just got a 28th year of funding by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So I'm not a drug abusologist, but they have funded my work. Published 282 publications, trained 72 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. So 
can a reductionist scientist make a contribution? I think so. Um, and I think we are beginning to see a, res a renaissance. I wouldn't say we're in full bloom, but I think we're getting there. Some of the things that Roland is doing, there's a group in New York University and other people are doing, I think we're going to get more and more publicity. And the public awareness and the media uh, coverage has been much less biased than it used to be. It used to be, it's like, these are crazy people, these are dangerous drugs, and now it's like, wow, tell us about these. How have you been doing this? What do you, how do these work? We're getting a lot more interest that is re-educating the public and neutralizing some of the toxic coverage that we got back in the 60s, 50s and 60s. So, is there a renaissance? Maybe, we're close, I think, and that's my story, so I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. Is the DMT when you take DMT orally in ayahuasca, is it different from when you... No, the classical view, which is what I would have to subscribe to, is when it gets to the receptors, it's the same way. There is a difference in terms of the route of administration. Any drug taken orally is a slower onset, more gradual plasma concentrations, whereas when you smoke it, it's more like intravenous injection. So it's in the system very quickly. And so it's the, it's the, rate, the rate of concentration rise in the brain plasma that really determines sort of that difference. So the sm smoked versus taken orally, it's really more rate of absorption and how quickly it gets into the brain. That's uh, every, everybody, in, everybody in pharmacology knows that. It's a, it's a well-accepted, well-studied fact with many kinds of different drugs. Any, oh. So his question revolved around the fact that these compounds were called psychotomimetics. When I, my PhD thesis says psychotomimetics in the title. Well, the good, the, the smart people are not calling them psychotomimetics.